I'm Graham Hectric. I've been uh, Dolphin County coroner since uh, 1990. Uh, I am not a physician, but I am a forensic scientist and a nationally certified medical legal death investigator. Uh, part of that, uh, I also had uh, investigative experience both with 385th Military Police and 52nd CID. Okay. So I have a combination of uh, uh, some science and also some investigative procedures. And since forensics is essentially science applied to law, it, it works out pretty well. Uh, we would be a hybrid office here uh, in that um, I am the coroner, but I also work as a board certified forensic pathologist. And uh, we, we work in tandem. Ultimately, the final decision on the certification comes down to me putting together the investigative side of it, the autopsy side, and coming to a conclusion of two things. The first one is cause of death, which is the mechanical reason why someone dies. And the other one is the manner. How did that, how did that happen? And that's uh, suicide. It could be, uh, excuse me, wait a moment. It could be suicide. It could be homicide. It could be accidental. It could uh, be natural. So those are the manners of death. So you have cause and manner. So it doesn't matter whether it's an ME's office or a coroner's office, ultimately the same thing is, can you determine the cause and manner of death with reasonable certainty? And can you then testify in court, that's where they applied to law, through chain of evidence and documentation and scientific theory, uh, what how do you defend that cause and manner of death that you've just put on a death certificate? And that's ultimately what occurs either in court or in civil litigation or criminal litigation, uh, our findings and how, how well it was documented. When we come to uh, what is now being called by the Cent uh, Center for Disease Control an epidemic, and that is a heroin e epidemic, an opioid epidemic. Uh, I can safely say, and, and I can tell you, you know, I could spell out the figures. The truth of the matter is, the figures don't tell the whole story nor ask the right questions. You can't look at any death coming through this office in a vacuum because deaths don't occur in a vacuum. Uh, they occur because of people's decision making. They occur because of how we as a society look at different issues. They occur because of structural things such as uh, decline in middle class, uh, decline in education over 30 years lack of job opportunities. All these things have a p impacts on how people behave. We live in quote unquote a free society, supposedly a republic. Oz Guinness, a writer, said in a free society there's two things. One is the structure, the law, in our case the Constitution. And then the other thing is the buy-in. The buy-in to say, and it's ironical, but this is what free societies deal with, and this is why they're short-lived, by the way. The buy-in to the Constitution is, I am going to restrict my behavior so that as a group, we can all be much more free. You don't need to legislate things because this person has bought into a moral agreement with his neighborhood, his community, his state, his country, and saying, no, we have a consensus here. And in this consensus, we've come up with these are appropriate behaviors and these are not. Now, not only does this filter into just the day-to-day -day worker, but it also 
factors in then to law and to our economic system, which we call capitalist. But if you look at it from a historical point of view, uh, we haven't been capitalists for about the last uh, 100 years. <laughs> now let me go through and tell you how that impacts why I'm seeing dead kids and dead baby boomers on the stainless steel tables over there because they've OD'd either on heroin, opioids, or a combination thereof. Right? Benjamin Franklin was asked when he left the Constitutional Convention, what kind of government did we have? And he replied to the lady, he said, Madam, what we have is a republic if you can keep it. Every one of the founding fathers knew we were on tenuous grounds because most free societies don't last long. If you would have asked John Adams, he would have said, as he wrote to Thomas Jefferson, the Republic's only going to last, and the Constitution is only a good document if we have a moral and religious people. Now, I don't think he was saying that they had to be some religion, a specific religion. But he, what he was saying is that if we don't have this buy-in part, it doesn't matter what the laws are. And we see this every day. We see this on all, uh, Wall Street, where in this supposed capitalist system, a government makes decisions on how we deliver mortgages to everybody. Right? Wall Street takes advantage of that by then making them into derivatives, which are trash securities, and sells them not only throughout America to retirement funds and banks, but to much of the world, knowing that that bubble was going to burst. But it's okay, because they got rid of the derivatives, they sold them, and now they're living down in Boca Raton, or somewhere on the main line, or wherever it is, and they're doing fine. Well, it was legal, but was it moral? Was it capitalism? Capitalism originally was conceived of as a system where somebody sells something to somebody else that sees the value in it, and they both win. And generally, it was actually a product. And the founding fathers were very concerned about all this, uh, but we don't seem to be today. What we're concerned with nowadays is K Street. K Street is where all the lobbyists go, the lobbyists that make six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars a year make suits that would feed people for a long, long time. And they influence government. And government likes this because it helps fund them to stay in power. But what it does is it reduces the sense of capitalism, where number one, you're actually producing something that's good or service for the people. Number two, that it's not all that highly regulated because it's in smaller groups many, many small businesses. Up until this point in our, our country, most people were getting employed, 80, about 80% 80 new jobs were in small businesses. But small businesses can't compete with K Street. And large businesses that say to the congressman, you know, if you do it this way, if you regulate business this way, I can push out all the small businessmen, but..." We big banks will do very well. But then you'll only have eight big banks to deal with, not all these small little community banks. That's what's happening right now. So why am I talking like that as a coroner? Because I'm seeing that we are having an increase in all kinds of drug use. But don't think of it at first as a drug. You, you, we don't have to ask why heroin's a problem. We have to ask why despair is the problem. Because despair is what is being anesthetized. They're in pain. 
They're either in pain because there's no moral reality nowadays, or they're in pain because they can't see a hope out of an endless cycle. Right up here, before I come in, there's a gas station. I was watching a Hispanic man, and I'm very conscious of that because my wife and I have a charity in the inner city here. It's called Estamos Unidos, and it helps kids that are Hispanic. He was filling up his car. Now, this was uh, about a month ago when gas was about 40, 40 bucks a gallon. Right, excuse me, not his car, his truck. Now, I worked as a carpenter to get through college and grad school. And I'm seeing what he has in the back of his truck, and I know he's a handyman because from the tools he had back there. And he was just shaking his head as he was watching the pump. And he's watching it go over $40, $50, the 65 I know what he was thinking. He was actually cheering up. And he was thinking, I'm going to drive there, and I'm going to lose half a, half a tank of gas a day, 30 bucks. I'm going to make 100 And I got three kids. i got to get back. You know, i got to get rice and beans on the table and maybe some meat this week, all of which have been taken off of, of the consumer price index of inflation so that we can postulate on TV that the economy is recovering and we're all better off. Well, that guy isn't better off. And he's not going to be better off. And anybody who went to a grocery store later will know that's true. So what do we do when we have pain? Well, if I have pain, I'll take an aspirin or ibuprofen or something like that. But if you have the kind of deep pain that there's no hope, you're going to take something much stronger. Now, that's one part of our society. And that's one thing I see. Because when you study how people die, you study how we live. And the next step is, when you have no hope, how do you anesthetize yourself? Well, we are a pill nation. We want a pill for everything. We want a pill for sex. We want a pill to feel good. We want a pill to lose weight. We want a pill to make us look better, or skin darker, you know, any of these things. The other day, I walked through, and I was watching, we had interns in, I was watching them, they were counting pills. We have a pill counter, because we have to collect all the pills at the scene, right? This was an elderly lady. She was prescribed 33 pills to take every day, 33 pills. The prescribing of opioids, commercial opioids in this country is insane. It is absolutely insane. And doctor shoppers are everywhere, and then there's also doctors that are willing to sell it. The control of it has not been consistent. And there are there are missing opioids from the from the drug company to the pharmacy. Robberies, pill free, that type of thing. It is very easy, but expensive, to give Oxycontin on the street, Oxycodone, those things. But we live in a society where mom and dad, if there is a mom and dad in the house, and that's, that's now 50% of the time not true, but mom and dad have a medicine cabinet. Now, people are running around talking about locking up guns, but the far more dangerous thing is a medicine cabinet. Because you've got kids that are 12, 13, 14 years old now that are going in and getting all kinds of commercial opioids and antidepressants, benzodiazepines, you know, all these psychotropic drugs, and using them because mom and dad use them. Everybody uses them. The TV says they're all good. You'll have maybe occasional anal leakage and you'll see Satan, but every other than that, everybody in the ad is smiling, right? And so there we are, and we have the advertisement that pharmaceuticals will take care of everything. 
They'll take care of all your pain and all your problems. Doesn't matter whether it's back pain or psychological pain. What happens is these kids get started early. And they get started early on uh, generally something like Oxycontin, Oxycodone, one other thing, opioids. But they're expensive if they have to get out on the street. And if mom and dad, and they've been to grandma's medicine cabinet, she doesn't have any anymore. So what do you do? You go out and buy very inexpensive heroin. And it's in a pure state nowadays. So you can snort heroin and still get a good high. And so they say, well, I'm snorting. I'm not shooting up. But it's the same thing. It's not good. We have had, uh, in this last year, some multiple deaths. I know they have down in Philadelphia and other places. Uh, heroin has been laced with fentanyl. These people drive very quickly because it's between 180, 80 to 100% stronger than the heroin itself. Now, it's always confounded me because from a, from a vendor point of view, why would you make the heroin so that it kills your customers? But the irony is that if you take a look at a heroin bag, a little cellophane heroin bag, most of them have a stamp on them. And the last one I think I saw was uh, uh, fentanyl and it was called wrecking ball. And it had a little stamp of a wrecking truck, you know, what are they called? With the hook on the back? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here we are, and we're talking about what can we do? What, what can do? How can we change this? And I'm afraid that we're always asking the wrong questions, and we're getting silly answers. It doesn't matter if we're asking about gun control or heroin abuse. The question is, how can we stop heroin? You're not going to. Heroin production in Afghanistan this year was higher than it's ever been. Our borders are wide open. It's going to come through. If there's users here, there's sellers. And that's the bottom line. So the real question that we have to ask on any of these quote unquote from the CDC epidemics is why are they occurring? And then be honest enough to look at them. I'm looking at kids that come from broken homes. There is no stability in the homes. If you go over here to Harrisburg school system, the average kid has to move every eight months. So when you say, go home and do your homework, where the hell is home? That's the kind of instability I'm talking about. I'm talking about kids that have drugs in the house, that the parents are users. I'm talking about an emptiness that has to be filled somehow, and opioids and heroin. I remember I ran myself over a farm tractor out of my farm. And I got into the UR, I knew the ER doc, and I said, give me morphine. And he gave me morphine. I bad leg. Ran over to my leg. It broke two of my ribs. And uh, man, that was that was nice. <laughs> so when you tell kids, well, drugs are bad. No, drugs do things. And in that case, I was happy for the morphine. But cognizant of what I do and feeling as the morphine was going up, going through my system, going from, from my arm through my lungs and then back into the, into the system and how it first then shoots up and fills uh, uh, the, the coronary arteries and goes back up the common carotid arteries into the head. I could track it. I could track it. It was awesome. And that's what's the problem. It, 
it works for that person that's sick in the soul, sick in the body, that's hungry, doesn't believe that there's hope out there, doesn't think they can change, and in my perspective, thinks that they're just an accident of nature, that they are not a creative being. And it's just heavy duty. You're not a creative being. If you're not creative, what the hell? That's, that's the problem. I give speeches every year to hundreds of kids. It's called Doors because I went through my own issues. And I tell them, and some of these kids, the last ones in were all kids that are on probation with gun violations or violent crime. And I was telling them that we've lied to them. We've lied to them big time. We've told them that they are just an accident. They're here. There is nothing other than that. You're here and that's it. Rather than saying, wow, you're created for a purpose. Once you find a purpose, it doesn't matter where you are. And I tell these kids, some of them sitting on long terms in jail, saying, I don't care if you're behind the bars. If you seek a purpose for your life and understand it, you were here to learn something. It doesn't matter whether you're Hindu, Jew, Christian, just a concept that you're here for a reason. Once you get that across, then everything else changes. And actually then suffering becomes a tool to teach you something else. But we live in a society that tells you that everything should be great all the time. And we know that that's not the case. So here we are, and we're worried about heroin. Well, if we did not have heroin, what would it be? We're coming out with the designer drugs now. And that will be the next epidemic. There will always be an epidemic. The question is how big? Well, it's only going to get smaller if we have a national dialogue on, number one, how we should behave. How we as individuals can restrain ourselves. Um, it was John Adams again. John Adams said, liberty is not doing what we want, but what we ought. So he got it. He got it. It is, we should be doing what we should be doing. We should do what Gandhi said and try to be the change we want to see in the world. Now, if we had that discussion and we got back that old twinkle of, in the eye of America where we said, wait a minute, this is a whole new experiment here. And we really still are an experiment, a very young country. And <laughs> sure, we'll go to the moon. There's no reason why we can't go to the moon. But there's also no reason why we can't burn coal cleanly because we, we have the freedom to think and solve problems. It's get together, solve problems. We can be energy, energy inefficient and it can take care of all these problems here. Do you think that, it, it's odd for me to be saying, even talking about energy, when we're talking about heroin, but if you're sitting in a house where I've seen them burn every other riser in the rental, down in the slums right here so that they could burn it in a fireplace that isn't functional because they can't pay for the oil. So don't tell me about global warming when, when these people can't even, they're going to be cold tonight. There are people that are going to be cold, cold, cold tonight. You walk into these places and there's newspaper all over the floor because they can't afford carpeting, but it's just so cold on their feet, you know. So they, they just take old newspaper and put it around so that it sort of insulates the floor. Uh, these are things we see, and my deputies see on a daily basis. We are a society in crisis, and people are going to anesthetize themselves. So when, until we start saying we have 
a larger crisis than heroin. Heroin is the symptom. It is saying people have to anesthetize themselves to get through this life. It is not the cause. The cause is all the other things I just talked about. And so if we really want to get hold of this problem, then we have to start doing these questions. And I think we have to do them in, in the charity we set up. My wife for the last seven, eight weeks has gone into uh, bilingual churches and stuff and talked about health issues. And uh, anything from just normal hygiene to diabetes to heroin, these issues to get the conversations going. And I think that if we get this conversation going, it's going to have to start from neighborhoods up. And we're, we're going to have to, you don't even need to call it what, uh, what so many people right now are so worried that some spiritual context could be with any program because we're supposed to be this great secular nation and not offend anybody. I don't know if we can exist as a Republican doing that because then everybody's doing what they want, not what they ought. We have to, dis we have to define the ought. We have to define what's gonna hold our country together. What can we do to make this country a better country and still be free? Not to have the dictates of how we learn, how we eat, you know, and right on down the line, you know, coming from some elite somewhere. So I think those are the things that have caused this despair that people say I can't take it anymore. Have we abandoned the younger generation? We've done them a great disservice, and abandon's an interesting word, because I think in our own hedonistic way to get everything we want out of life, uh, we've uh, forgotten our role as parents. <laughs> I remember uh, within my own life, uh, my son, uh, and his wife, when they got married, um, and then they had a child, they made a decision, and my son was not making a great income at the time, said, now, she's going to stay home with the child. And I said, well, son, I can get her a job. I mean, I got influence, right? I can get her a job. He said, no, Daddy. He says, the thing is that we just think the most important thing is raising the kid. Now, 14 years later, he's in the upper 1% of mathematics. He's 14 years old. He's already taken college courses. He's homeschooled. He's uh, a captain of the Northeastern All-Star Surfing Association or something. The other members elected him <laughs> because of his attitude in life and that sort of thing. Um, He's, he'll be going shortly over to Hawaii uh, to surf over there at 14. Mother's going along, of course. And he'll still be going to school. But they did what I didn't really initially think about, and that was, wow, they're, they're going to make that a primary part of their lives. Now, I did to an extent, but I was driven with many other things other than that. So. And frankly, I think my father, my son's been a better father seeing how busy I was going through life than I had been, you know. And it taught me a, it taught me a great lesson, you know, that, wow, you know, we got to get back to basics here. If we get back to basics, if we start caring for our own communities, if we start treating each other, uh, with just a more, a bit more respect. If we do this debate in such a way that it's not 
This isn't right or left. This isn't Democrat or Republican. Uh, I, I have I have liberals and I have conservatives dying on the tables. The discussion has to be what do we conceive as good and profitable for this republic we have, and what do we see is going to destroy it. And be honest in our estimation, do our debates, because within unanimity there can be diversity. After all, if we go back to the original uh, uh, founding fathers, they, they were all over the chart in how they thought of a law and a creator beyond themselves. They were all over the charts. I remind everybody that the greatest financier of the war was a Jew. It wasn't for him, we wouldn't have had a revolutionary war because we couldn't have financed it. He ended up broke, but one of the best friends of George Washington. So if you look back, and unfortunately, we don't even teach these things in school anymore. The kids don't know, they don't know anything about the government. I was teaching in a university class the other day. It was election day. And I said to the kids, I said, how many of you voted today? I was just curious. Zero. Zero. And these are kids that are in science, they're in science curriculums. But when you ask them questions about the foundation and philosophy of how we came to be as Americans, what a republic is opposed to a pure democracy in the life. They have no idea. Because it's not taught in schools anymore. Is it, is it a coincidence, or is it a result of drugs, or is it a result of what you're saying, that we now rank number 36 in the world in education right above Nicaragua? Well, I saw those figures myself. It's interesting that I hate to quote a politician, but Ronald Reagan said the closest thing to eternity on earth is a government program. And he, sadly, he's right. But it's not only here. When I was a criminal investigator over in Europe, I was in Rome, and there was a big building that was called the Garibaldi Veterans Building. And there was a bureaucracy in it. The only issue was all the veterans were dead. So nobody knew why they were servicing dead veterans. <laughs> but that's Italy, you know, very bureaucratic. So, so it, it, would, it amused me then, it saddens me now, because now I see it in the United States, where just programs will not die, nor will they be, uh, if you're in corporations, or even just running this office, you have to plan, you have to check, and then you have to act. If you don't check, you can't rudder the course to a better course. And when we look at education, put the numbers down and tell me how it worked. Once we took, which the, the founding fathers said, we have to get education in the states because the states have different demographics, different cultures, different people. And it should be controlled at its at the lowest level, the states and the counties. And it should not be controlled by the federal government. And then we changed that, I think it was in the 60s. But I looked at a chart, it was an amazing chart. And any child, my 14-year-old grandson could have said, whoa, we're in trouble here, aren't we? Because here goes up. Uh, the budget of the Federal Department of Education. And here goes the test scores. Now, it doesn't take a genius, and I am not a genius. And I look at that and I say, wow, why wasn't that chart up there? Why isn't that the discussion? In, we just had a governor's race here. And the issue was, on both sides, uh, 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 governor Wolf, the governor-elect Wolf, would say, we're not spending enough. And Corbett would say, no, I spent more. 
The question is, why are we spending anything without changing the programs? Because they're not working. So again, it goes back to, if we're looking at heroin, let's ask the question, why? Why? Now, one thing I'd like to do is there was a, I was, I was doing a, a, a thesis paper, and it was on accidental combined, un, unattended drug overdose. And uh, it's funny the way things work out. I'm about ready to complete this paper, but I had a young girl just about ready to graduate from one of the high schools around here. And she died of a heroin overdose. She was like an A-B student. She was suburbia. I mean, if people think this is a city problem, it is not. It's all over. We, we, had, we had more heroin deaths with the fentanyl up in the Millersburg area than we had down here. That's country up there. Yeah. But here was this girl, and she died. And we, we had done the, uh, the investigation. And it was a heroin overdose. She started as a kid out of those medicine cabinets and then graduated to heroin. Beautiful young lady. I'm collating this thing and ready to send it off to this university. I was doing the paper for it. And Jill, my secretary, says there's a mother who's here to see you. And she came in. And she said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm doing a paper on unintended drug overdose, which was, her daughter was one of those statistics, one of those numbers. And she said, I have a poem my daughter wrote two weeks to her sister, her younger sister, before she died, before she overdosed. Would you be willing to put the poem in the paper? I said, well, let me see it. So I took a look at it, and I put it in the paper. Now, I've read that poem to many people. I'll go over to my office, I'll get it, you know, and we can read that poem. But it pretty much tells you what an 18-year-old kid is thinking when they're strung out on heroin. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Her mother read it at the funeral of this girl in hopes that some of the other kids in the audience, which I know are doing heroin, would wise up and say, doesn't matter whether you snort it or you're eventually going to inject it anyways. Uh, but the problem is, I gave a, I gave a, a financial scholarship. I did, Astonishing Needles did, this charity we have. And we had, I think, seven or eight recipients. I have a farm we're sitting out by this pond fire going there. I'm looking across at this guy and I knew that he was street and he knew that I knew. Right? And uh, I said, Nelson, what's your story? He said, I was a heroin addict for 14 years. I said, really? He said, yeah. And I said, how do you get off of it? I said, I'm sort of against uh, a lot of these uh, methadone programs and stuff like that because they're replacing one bad thing for another. He said, I agree with you. Now we're giving him a scholarship because he's going to hack. He wants to get a master's in social work so he can work in drug-free clinics, right? He said, you know, he says at first I blame the cops because they arrested me. So then I started blaming the dealer. He said, I've been in and out of rehab, nothing happened. Just relapsing back. He says, it was never until I started to blame Nelson that I got better. He said, I took methadone for three days just to get over the worst of the withdrawals. He says, but I've been drug three ever since. I said, man, you're my hero. I said, it took me such a long time to quit smoking cigarettes. You know, and you kicked heroin. I said, that's awesome. He teared up. It makes me tear up. He says, you know what? I did this week. I said, what? 
She says, I bought a house. He says, it's in the city. He said, it isn't much, but I bought a house. And I knew I was looking at a man that for years had eaten out of dumpsters and would do anything for a needle. So Nelson cured the problem, not until he could cure the pain that heroin can't take care of. It can cover it up. But he had to take care of the pain himself. And once he did that, then he could break it because it's too strong. It's too strong. It's, I still remember that tractor accident. And I knew because of being an addictive personality of, of somebody that, that smoked for years, that's kid stuff. And that's what kids have to understand. It's not that it's bad, it's that it's too good to play with. It can control you. And that's what this poem says. So let me go get that, okay? okay. I have one question I want to ask you yep. as well. Why, <laughs> as much as I've worked in major urban areas, I, I won't do this in the interview when you come back, I get it in the urban areas. I, I mean, uh, the hell, the lives, they've had to live not having parents, the abuse, the trauma, and all that. It, it's definitely understandable. What I don't get is suburbia. That when I just can't register. Well, suburbia is a lie. Suburbia is a lie because we don't really clearly define poverty. Uh, poverty can be both spiritual as well as financial. So you can go to some of the nicest neighborhoods here and people are living on a thread. They got it all, but they have nothing. Jibran said that luxuries move in our house as a guest and end up being master. Because now you got all the credit cards, you got the damn car payment, you have this, you have this. You're on Camus' treadmill. You know, and you're just, you're trying to make it to the top, but the rock keeps on coming down. And that's where these people are. And so... You're referring to Albert Camus? Yes. Okay. And, and the whole structure starts to fall apart. The mm -hmm. dream is not there. The dream becomes the nightmare. So that's what we're dealing with in, in suburbia. We have parents that can't be parents because they're working their butts off all the time. Or they're trying to look younger. Or they're having an affair at the office or whatever it is. But they can't be parents, and that goes back to your question: Is have we have we failed our kids? Yes, yes we have. I do believe we have. We have. And this is, this is the most interesting interview I've ever had. <laughs> I will tell you that. But because it, everybody gets mired in the statistics, we get mired in. That's how, That's not how we're going to change exactly. things. Exactly, and we can't legislate. We cannot incarcerate our way out of this. And yet, that's where all these programs are focused on. That's right. We're going to get more. We're going to we're going to interdict the uh, the heroin trade. We can't interdict anything across our borders right now. <laughs> so that's just silliness. So let's and, get. And, and as you said, if you take one away, ten other drugs will replace it. Oh yeah, I can't. Uh, the toxicology panels can't keep up with the new designer drugs and, yeah. and stuff like that. So. Here we are, we have a large industry, the pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. which convinces everybody they got a pill for everything. We have a morbidly obese population, 60% morbidly obese. another addiction. It's, sure, it's another addiction. It's another heroin, mm -hmm. in a way. But we don't talk, what do we do? We, uh, we have school lunch programs. Now, do you think these people really ate themselves into misery because they need food? Well, in some ways they do because they're eating carbohydrates all the time, which tell you you're always hungry. And it elevates your sugar, then slams down, elevates your sugar, and slams down your blood sugar. So, but we really should be dealing with the issue of why do you eat so much? Why do you need that feeling of contentment. What other parts of your life are you not content with? Right? And then it only stacks one upon the other. I, I watch, I well, watch. the other paradox. 
Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. Is the other paradox that we have become so frail and so weak that the least amount of pain, and we can't take it. And so we need to reach for instant relief. It's, it's really, I mean, that's it. When I've seen two practices of medicine. And I am not a doctor, right? So I am not an MD. But I see two practices of medicine. And what we are designing right now is a practice of medicine where you go in and you say, here are my symptoms. I say, I got these sore knees, I got, and I got bad lower back. Well, I didn't mention I'm 325 pounds. You know. We actually have to buy new stretchers that are wider and can handle up to over 500 pounds because the population's changing. Now that again, look at how we're dying and you'll see how we're living, right? <laughs> the question is, why do we exactly. involve ourselves in gluttony? Exactly. It's what it used to be called, gluttony, mm -hmm. right? All these things go back to who's in control of our own lives. Is it us? Is it the marketing people? Is it the government? It used to be the concept, going back to what Oz Guinness said, that you restrict some of your freedom so everybody else is better off. We don't need a colossal medical program. We need people to take care of their bodies. And then we'll reduce the cost. It's, it doesn't matter. Any program you look at is telling you that we didn't do the buy-in. Okay. Um, I've gone into houses where there's hardly any food, hardly any heat, and there's a dead old lady on the floor. Mm -hmm. And then the daughter shows up in a Lexus. And they hadn't, f she decomposed, almost skeletalized, because nobody had checked on her, right? And you say, well, you know, don't go inside, your mother's inside, and she's been dead for some time. Oh, I'm so sad. Say, what can you tell me about her? Well, she was on Social Security. What does that tell you about our society? That is the mother of your mother. She hasn't been checked in 30 days. She's living on a pittance. Can't even get out of the house. And it's okay because she's living on Social Security. The government is taking care of it. Narcissism, of course, plays a big role in all of this. Sure. Self-centeredness. Self -centeredness. Yeah, self-centeredness. Narcissism. But then I, I, and when you travel outside of this country, such as I have Central America, Mexico, Colombia, and South America, you don't realize the full scope of how self-centered this society is until you get outside of it. Right. Right. And, and it, it's, it's almost disgusting. It's... Way. It's not capitalism. No. Capitalism provides the greatest amount of freedom. But as John Paul once said, he said it doesn't matter whether it's communism, socialism, or capitalism. If it is moral, it's not good. And what's happened with our system of free market is we've lost the concept of responsibility. Again, the buy-in. Mm -hmm. You don't sell people crap. You don't you don't steal from them on contracts. Accountability. Yeah, accountability, but not to government, but to your fellow man. And that's the difference, because that's the only way it can work. You can always get around regulation, or you can pass it and then we'll read it, you know, you know that type of thing. But it is a personal responsibility. My doctor used to come to our house. Right. And he was a friend. He was in Rotary with my old man. And he got a lot of payment over the year in vegetables and, you know, all this sort of stuff. He lived a happy life. He knew he was doing good for his community because he handled the people that couldn't handle things. And it was almost like a member of the family. Doc Wagner, I still remember his name, you know. That's where we've come from. The postman, milkman. 
the yeah. man who owned the business down the street. They were all part of the community. And yet, you know, it, it's, it's but, so, and when the stock market goes up, that means less jobs, less opportunities. Yeah. And entrepreneurial is pretty much dead. In our country, it is right now. Uh, I just saw, and it astounded me, because I've, I've lived like you in other countries. It is now easier to set up a business in what is relatively a socialist state, Germany, than it is the United States. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. I think we're like tenth down the list now for starting a business uh, with ease. And um, I can understand we have the highest corporate tax in the world. You know, so. Uh, and as I've seen in Colombia, I mean, they, they came from uh, the Escobar regime, where there were 500 murders every day yeah. in Medellin. Now they have, is on fire. now they have 32. Now they have 32. And they, in... went, they went out and they embraced the people in the barriers. Yes. They brought them into mainstream. Right. And therefore, they pushed the cartel so far into the Amazon. If you mention the Esca name Escobar when you go to Colombia, you're lucky if you get out alive. Yeah. But that embracing of the people from the barriers ensured that that type of scenario will not occur again. Well, there's the other thing. If we go forward and we try to get rid of the epidemic of heroin, it's not going to be done by the government because uh, C.K. Chesser didn't said, the government dispenses mercy as coldly as it does justice. It has to be humans. It has to be humans going into the Hill District and saying, está muy mal, muy mal, which is what my wife does. And she tells how she came from the projects. She's Mexican. She came from the projects. She worked her way up first in her and her family to get a bachelor's degree. She has an MBA, and she's giving back to her community. How many people of minority stature have gotten out of the community and then forget the community? They abandoned it. They abandoned it. Yes. And the, the, the premiers of those are the politicians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they don't even live in the communities they regulate. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and to look to government, to law enforcement, or anything as a solution to this? It's not going to happen. It's going to take love. And that, now that, that puts me back in the 60s again, right? Right. But it's true. It's true. It takes love. I have hugged a lot of heroin addicts. Mm -hmm. And I hugged, I, I hugged Nelson because he is a hero. He is a hero. That's what we should be accenting. We should be yeah. accenting people like Nelson. And we should be accenting the horror that that 18-year-old girl went through. So that we tell the true story. Not that heroin is the evil. Heroin is the tool to cover up the evil. That's, that's where we're at. And, and defined over the last 40 years. what parents' responsibility is. True. We have, we are now trying to define marriage itself. You know, is marriage an institution where two people come together, they create a human, and then the responsibility is then to protect them because the human, oddly enough, is the mammal that needs the most protection through their youth and everything. And then are we going to educate them and then put them through rites of passage so they become members of a community? It seems to me that we've given all that up to a large extent and should we be having a conversation that this could possibly be harmful to our society? You know, these are the type of conversations. I was asked to do a, a pilot for a &E. <clears throat> And I do a lot of press conferences. I'm probably one of the most open coroner's offices. 
only because I just don't think we're talking about the right things. And if we don't start doing this, we're whistling through the graveyard. If we don't engage those kids, absolutely, is going to change. And that's what Heroin Project is yeah. about. That's why I'm doing this, and that's why I have the music and all the other things. If we're going to reach them, we have to reach them at their level. We have to give them opportunities. If it's going to be their music, I have hip-hop singers, I have rock singers, and so forth. So I'll push back against drugs and against the type of lifestyle living. Right. In Northern Philly, I've got some hip-hop singers pushing back and showing hope and how to do that. I mean, these are the kids you have to reach out to. It starts a movement. And there, a there's, some, there's some great hip-hop music out there that's talking about our lack of values. Yes. There's this one young man that, uh, man, I just heard, if I can find it, I'll send it I to you. Ha I have five groups right now I'm working with. Awesome. Harrisburg, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Pittsburgh. Yeah. So. No, I, 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 I think it just comes down to... Well, you, 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 we have you, to have you these said discussions. it more eloquently yeah. than I've been able to get it. I, I, I will use this as part of the, uh, you know, our mission statement because you're saying it better than I ever could. Well, it's only because of the, I'm the one taking the kids apart and, yeah. and looking at them and then listening to Senator Fatbottom say, well, we're going to do this and we're going to yeah. do that, we're going to legislate. And you just said it, you cannot legislate this. Yeah. We have to, we have to, as citizens of this country, we have to roll up our sleeves, start loving each other, taking care of each other, respecting each other, find out what our commonalities are, and then debate the differences. But the difference with the debate is you debate the idea and you don't go hostile against the person. We want to always attack the person and not attack the issue. Yeah. And, and that, is, that is part, in part, because of politics. Politics today is politics of division rather than cohesion. Because that's the way politicians and oligarchies and business and everything else stay in power. Separate and divide. Separate and divide. And I'm saying just the opposite. I'm saying let's start from the communities and let's, let's get together. If we can change one community, we can change another community. If we can change that community, we can change another. Is it an exaggeration or understatement when I, I often make this remark? that every major urban area has already collapsed. No, it's true. It's true. Yeah. And, and the, the suburbs are, are following. Yes. Um, we're going to come into a financial collapse uh, mm -hmm. relatively shortly. I'd say within the next two, three years. And I fully expect also terrorist if attacks. we wouldn't have printed the false money, we'd have been there. We, we'd be, well, actually, we'd be in recovery. Yes, exactly. Uh, we would be in recovery because it would have been a painful hit for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then we would have gone off like gangbusters because uh, government itself would have had to shrink <coughs> because there was just no money. And when government sh would shrink, you uh, can do one thing. You can raise taxes, but that kills growth and you can cut them. The Roaring Twenties was brought on because government cut its size in half. They were actually going through a depression. They cut the size in half, got rid of the depression in two and a half years, and we went into the Roaring Twenties. But then they started to expand and grow again. And it got and, corrupted and manipulated. Right. And then we had the uh, stock market crash. Right. So uh, history tells us that, that almost like the heroin, the, it, it's replicated. The stock market comes down and everybody says, oh, we can't take the pain. So they come in with the heroin, which is the stimulus program and printing the money. So now we're on the heroin. Sure. So it's just another heroin. Mm -hmm. So see, that takes us back to what yeah. is the discussion? Heroin is a big right. problem, but, and we can solve that problem if we start taking care of each other, loving people, and saying, you know, 
This education system sucks. Nobody has opportunity. We have 1.2 trillion in student loan debt out there. And I'm teaching at a university, even in a STEM course university, and I'm looking at these kids and I'm saying, you know what? 50% of these kids won't be able to pay back their loans, at least. At least 50%. Well, you said a trillion, a trillion is not going to come back, period. Just... Oh, no. No, it's gone. And another problem is that it becomes part of the industry. This is why uh, the prices of tuition are going up way beyond that of inflation is because it's subsidized. When the government kind of money comes in, they're taking kids into colleges and universities and putting them in courses they don't need. They're not counseling them well. These kids get out and they have fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars of loan, and they are unemployable. The other factor I found as well is that a lot of them can't pass drug tests. Well, I can believe that too. And I tell you, I've had some that are just there for the ride. Yeah. They'll, they'll I mean, Noahsville and some of these others will, all you <laughs> have to do is attend and you get oh, a that's degree. Great. That's great. And the, the, the uh, professors that I knew that have been in like Ohio State, Penn State, and other universities have quit because they, in all good consciousness, could not further reduce their morality of standards to, because they were flunking too many students. Students who would come up and say, well, we couldn't find the answer to this test on the internet. And just as one example, and he said, well, did you take notes in school? Oh, were we supposed to take notes? And they're in college. They're in college. <laughs> I'm going to let you go get there. Right, that's my case about the educational system, right? right? Okay. The, the putting Narcan out there will save lives, but it's just another program to take care of the symptom and not mm -hmm. the problem. And until we have conversations about the problems, we roll up our seat. I'm not saying that any of this is easy work because we've been doing some inner city work and uh, it's not easy. Our, our particular charity that uh, Ezzy and I and some others helped start, my wife, has no executive director and no building. Everything is run from a computer and the leadership by the peoples within the community. Because they got to have skin in the game. And it builds leadership skills. I mean, we've taught people what Robert's rules of order are and time management and project management. Some of these people have gone on to have very nice jobs and everything else. <coughs> I've had people walk through a snowstorm to get so we could wrap packages for kids to get them for Christmas. Inner city people, no, no cab, no car, because they can't afford a cab or the, or the buses weren't running, but they walked. I thought we'd have nobody show up and everybody showed up to help. You know? don't, don't pass these moral judgments on people that... Do you find that people in urban sectors are more giving of themselves than in suburbia. In some ways. In some ways. If, if, uh, if you're looking for generosity, I, I helped actually one of the guys that founded the better, the very charity that we're in. He had just come over from Nicaragua, Ecuador. Ecuador. Okay. And I took him under my wing. Now, this guy had an engineering degree and a doctoral degree in Ecuador, but it was nothing here. He was working in a vegetable plant, you know, processing vegetables, he and his wife. Invited me down to the hill 
to their apartment for ceviche. Okay? Now, I'm not a great humanitarian, but I do love ceviche. So <laughs> I went down there, right? <clears throat> and I remember Hector, Hector Ortiz. I'm now God, godfather for his one adopted daughter whose mother was a crack whore and his father was shot. And he took care of the force as a force child. They couldn't give it back because there was potential that the mother might get the kid back. They couldn't do it. And so they adopted the child. Since then, they've adopted two other very special children. And that's his way of giving back for the opportunity he has here. He now lives in suburbia. He's living the American dream, but he's taking responsible for that dream, taking responsibility for it and introducing it to other people and hence the charity and so many other things he's done. He was just elected the first district governor of Rotary of color. And he did all this like in 12 years. He's a wonderful man, good man, but he, he, he has the buy-in. We have heroin addicts that if you could help them with the heroin and give them a little hope and a little love, they'd do the buy-in. They'd be good citizens in the future. I even created a newspaper, Bilingual, which is now in Seven County, La Voz Latina Central. And the whole purpose of that was body, mind, and spirit. So we had Dr. Araya writing about things like heroin addiction, diabetes, bad diets. Uh, I'm writing something right now on personal responsibility and what our moral consensus should be. I'm not talking about soccer or chi-chis or anything else. I'm saying, I respect you. I respect your culture. I know you have a tremendous culture with family values and everything else. So that's what I'm going to play, play with. I'm not going to go to your most purient interest. And you know what? The paper's growing. I'm not making money off of it, <laughs> unfortunately, right. but it has been growing. We had to add, just uh, add another 10,000 in circulation. Heroin Project is and, growing as well. It's a nonprofit. I'm not making any money off of it. Well, anything, anything that you need exposure in the, in the Latin community, you let me know because okay. yeah, I, I definitely we're pushing care. it out. Yeah. Because we need more people to come forward for interviews. Uh -huh. We need acting talent to produce commercials and billboards. Right. Some of them are very, really, I mean, they're very graphic and they're powerful. Uh, the one I just completed last week is a girl that's pregnant five months. Shows her shooting up. Now, we simulate uh, right. the veins and everything else. Imagine driving down the road and you see a billboard and the caption is, uh, we have several for that billboard. So what you're doing is you're starting the real conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm provoking. This is the real conversation. Right. And it has to be almost like, America, let's talk. Exactly. Yeah. I, I let's hope talk. it does infuriate people. Yeah. I hope it causes them to slam on their brakes. I hope they make all kinds of phone calls and complain. They with the ethnic communities here simply because I tell the truth. And that's... And, and, and they know I love them, too. Mm -hmm. they, they know I love them. And I have to love them. I love the bastards I hate. <laughs> <laughs> because if it's the drug dealer or the, the yeah. real creep, you know, I, I, have to I still them. have to love them because I know they got there in a very bad way. Yes. I know that some of them could probably run major corporations with the distribution chains Absolutely. they set up. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, but that's not the case. But I still go back it's to the, the point. Only I look at them as a human being that was created. And I wish I could get them on a path so there was meaning in their life. Yeah, you know, it just. It's sad what we're doing to each other. It is. It's just sad. And, and, we, and a really lot of times we, we call them, I, I, I do it <coughs> myself, because at the end of the day, you can't get emotionally involved with everything I see in on the horizon. Oh, I know. Same but here. You have to call them junkies. You have to call them 
junkie breeder or whatever else it might be because otherwise you're gonna get you're gonna get PTSD. I've had, I had it one when Megan went I, a few times. Oh, I believe it. Uh, every death, every murder, every from beginning to end, all of it just kept rolling back and rolling back, and that went on for a couple of weeks. And I can see in this office. I'm on call 24 hours a day. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. And there comes a point. I don't get off much. I probably had in the last seven years. I probably had 20 days off, 30 days off. Okay. Yeah, I can okay. relate. So. I get called through the night. Generally, I just, as he's amazed, because, you know, somebody's killed with a samurai sword or something like that. And I say, well, we got to do this, we got to do that. We got to look for blood patterns and, you know, arrange autopsies and police and everything. And I go back to bed. And she's like, he's asleep already. <laughs> but from years of being a criminal investigator and doing it, you just, it's, that's life. One, one will hit you. One's going to hit but you. But one hit you. I had, just... I had a York County case of a child that was beaten with a Game Boy player, mm -hmm. the controls in the court. And I handled a lot of child abuse, but that was the one. That was the one. That was the one I couldn't get out of my mind. Even to this day, I still can't get out of it. And there are just certain scenes, and Ground Zero being one of them, that uh, I worked down there. And, Probably two months into it, I was working down there. Yeah. And, and there's nothing worse in my mind than when I've had addicts lie out my arms. Sometimes they'll intentionally OD in front of the camera. I hate it. Wow. They know they're doing it, but you know, hey, I'm going to go out. I'm going to do it on camera. Sure, the guy cereal, they'll pump me with Narcan. Yeah. That's the problem with Narcan. Well, no, I, I, there was no Narcan available. Oh, jeez. But the one that got me the most was the one that bled all over me. And I said, let's see, I, call, I always call him Kansas. He was in Philadelphia, and he was from, from Kansas. Yeah. And nice enough guy and everything, and one day I'm talking to him. He wouldn't have done anything for me. And I looked down at his leg. I said, Steve, you, you got a major problem down there. I said, you're starting to bleed out your leg. He panicked, took off. Wrong thing to do. Yeah. I grabbed him, threw him in the bathroom, public bathroom, started to get his clothes off, took a knife, and started cutting his pants apart, put a belt around, tried to, right. I couldn't, I couldn't stop. I was set with blood, arteries busted out, yeah. needles that were in there, that were in there for years. Uh, it was just, that, that stuck with you. But you, you realize at that point, unless you're a sewing machine, you can't save somebody in that. No. no. It was just, and I was so, literally soaked in blood. Those, those, Kind of things hit. Oh, uh, you never forget them. No. Yeah. But the other ones you can walk back, and, and for whatever reason, you can leave at the end of the day and just say another day in paradise. Yeah. And then there's that one that's going to hit you, and then it starts rolling all the other ones out. It's a curious thing. Um, I remember the pilot that I did for A and E. It was called Ram of Evidence, and. Uh, uh, but one intern said, I feel guilty and exhilarated at the same time. She said, because I've just seen my first autopsy, homicide autopsy, but at the same time, some mother lost a daughter. You know, she said, it's, it's really a paradox. I don't know how to feel. Mm -hmm. you know? And I can understand that feeling because there are times when we're working a case and I know we're doing really well at what we're doing, capturing the evidence, finding things others didn't, and all that. And I'm sorry <laughs> because this is what I do. Right. But on the other hand, it's somebody's dead kid there or somebody's mm -hmm. dead husband. Yeah. And that comes later. But I have that realization later. But uh, you're right. It doesn't hit you immediately. Yeah. It just all of a sudden out of the blue. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Now, let me read this to you. Okay. It's Natalie Kribari, and I was allowed to use her name. Okay. Through poison tainted veins, I feel a warmth that soothes, but it's surreal. It's funny how we became acquainted. 
He made me quiver. I almost fainted. He seemed so cool, so calm, so sweet. He swept me off my virgin feet. We fell in love, or so I thought. My soul, not my love, is what he sought. He hid his identity with a comforting mask, only to disguise his horrid task. With every kiss he sucked me dry, his soft caresses all a lie. He came inside me just a little prick. It made me lightheaded and a little bit sick. He abused me raw until my arms were sore. My cheekbones were visible, but I craved more. He made me chase him and steal and lie and cheat. He wore down my body until I fell in defeat. He cackled at my pain, his full destruction of me. But I am too dope sick. I can't see. Still, I begged and I pleaded for him to return an ongoing cycle. Why didn't I learn? So in, at night, I fell asleep with him by my side, but woke up with no one. He promised and he lied. So today, again, I make it my priority, my chore to find him in vain and again be his whore. His passion I want, I crave, I need, I rush to get filled, that indeed. I may never make it, but to you I dare say, if, I sh if you, no, if he should strut by, look the other way. He'll charm you and flirt, and with his deadly advances he'll shower you with false promises and convincing romances. With a wink of his eye and his look, he could sway. This is your warning. So darling, take heed. What he does offer you, you surely don't need. A handful of problems, a life that is dark, in no time he'll have you. And your gravestone he'll mark. That's phenomenal, isn't that? It? That would make a great song. Well, you are right. You that are right. Perfect song. Well, I'm going to give you a copy of it. Yes, that. please. I'll give you a copy of it.